Great. So I call our meeting to order. This is the April 21st, 19 or 2021, ooh, 2021 meeting of the Finance Subcommittee of the RTD Accountability Committee. And so we will start as usual with the opportunity to review the minutes and make any suggested changes to those. I would mention that Ron and I made a few really minor changes, spelling corrections and things like that already. But if anybody Ron, has any other can, changes or corrections. Can I just, just tell for the committee, just so everyone knows, um, real quickly, um, Dea was listed twice in the attendee list, Dea Zavala. Um, I misspelled um, flat out as two words instead of one, so we'll correct that. And um, I think we got, there was a, a grammatical error in um, one of Elisa's statements. Um, so we'll just fix that grammatical error. Not her statement, but the way it was kept. I, I might Not, yeah, you know, what was wrong with that? It was how I recorded it. Thank you, Russ. <laughs> I don't hear a lot of grammatical errors from Elise. <laughs> okay, uh, let's, uh, let's move on. Uh, Ron, you are up to talk about RTD financial information, which by the way, is, is really an excellent piece of work put together to summarize some of the challenges that we're facing. Yeah, so um, we included this in the agenda packet. Um, so I think you'll, you'll hear a theme. We're just trying to get some things in front of the subcommittee so we can start pulling some pieces together that will lead into text and content for the final report and uh, to frame uh, whatever recommendations come out of your work. Um, so actually, I'll give a lot of credit to Natalie Shishido, and I'll scroll down here just so you can see. Um, Natalie was uh, did the heavy lifting here to sort of pull together lots of different pieces that we've looked at over the last few months and um, you've all seen before. And we're, the, the goal here is to basically summarize or put kind of frame the financial issues um, uh, for the final report um, as requested by the accountability committee's um, charge from the governor, uh, the legislative leadership and RTD. Uh, so we're trying to trying to capture those big sort of um, uh, financial context pieces uh, to, to frame the recommendations. So wanted to get this in draft form to you to give you the opportunity to review. Does it sort you know, so feedback, feedback we'd be looking for, does it sort of strike the right level of detail? Does it have the right information in, does it, in it? Is there, are there additional pieces of information that you'd like included in um, sort of the financial framework piece um, of the document? Are there things in here that you think are extraneous? And then the last piece is, uh, I think our intent is we will have a summary piece that sort of tries to capture all of this into sort of a, a few paragraphs to try to frame RTD's current and um, kind of upcoming financial picture um, as part of the final report. So that's that. We will have to do some updating of this. I know because RTD just got their most recent revenue forecasts, um, uh, I, don't, I think a week or so ago. Um, so we're, we're kind of looking at that and RTD's done some, some good briefings for, for the RTD board um, of that. So there's some, some updating of information and data that will go into this as well. So I just want, with that, I hand it over to the committee and I think we're just looking for feedback and, and input on this piece. I would say that these bar charts that uh, are produced in this report would be really valuable to have on our dashboard. So I'm sure, I'm sure that uh, we'll pick up on that. Natalie's in our in our group here. Uh, so I ask uh, the committee members comment if you'd like to. And I thought the information looked pretty good um, and about the right level of detail. I don't have a lot to add. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I, I was impressed by the way it was all pulled together. Uh, Natalie did a great job and I'm sure that Rebecca was engaged in that as well. Um, I, I do wanna have a chance to, dis, to discuss the spending recommendations as well, since we're getting closer and closer to the point where we're going to actually make formal recommendations. We don't have to say for example, vote on these 
recommendations at this point. Uh, but I do want to uh, just basically have any kind of feedback, especially on those, because I think they're pretty close to what we're going to wind up recommending. Elise, did you read through those as well? Would you pop those up? Yeah, I, I, yeah. I just scrolled down to those. I think those are from what the accountability committee supplied to RTD as a formal recommendation for the for the most recent round of federal stimulus funding. Right. And I don't really see any reason not to include them again in the finals. No, I think um, we should because there have been <laughs> several tranches of federal money and it's hard to know what else will flow and they're still valid. Yeah. I don't think Krista, for example, was out there on the uh, previous round. Yeah, the, mo the most recent round. So I think if, yeah, if the accountability committee feels like these still stand and just want to reiterate those for RTD to con um, consider for all new, you know, additional federal stimulus fund that funds that might come. Yep. Does anybody have any objections or concerns about including them? Yeah. Right. Yes, Rebecca? Well, I guess I'm, I'm, I guess where I get a little lost is um, what would this represent now? So it's about $700 million that's come to RTD overall. And, I, you know, at what point are these dollars um, have been sufficient enough to sort of respond to the COVID crisis? And um, are we moving now into a phase where they, they actually have some um, some funding that can go to things beyond the uh, sort of immediate crisis. And I'm just wondering if, if given that it's the charge of our committee to kind of look more at that long term, do we want to be a little bit more nuanced now that we're looking at not just 400 million, but I think if my math's right, an, an additional tranche that maybe is above and beyond what is needed just, just to handle the problem in front of them. And, and I say that not really knowing if that's the case or not, because I, I don't know what the latest projections are um, given the continuing crisis that RTD does face. Deborah, I, I wonder if you might be able to respond to that and, and also uh, respond to the question of how these the latest sales tax estimates uh, for revenue coming from there, uh, where those might be relative to where we were and what we were expecting. So thank you very much and good morning to all of you. I think right now where we are, we're still in a state of ambiguity as it relates to where we are collectively recognizing that we are getting funds in, but to qualify this for all of you all, we just received notification last Monday as the last Monday, I believe the 19th as it relates to our CRISA allocation, right? And so recognizing that ARPA was effectuated um, we still don't have an understanding what that means in the stipulations as it relates. So going back to Krissa, in reference to the grant application that was executed, it solely said salaries, fuel, utilities, and um, bus and rail operations. I give that just as a qualifier because recognizing we are getting this money and as we balance things out that we could potentially um, swap monies for other aspects. Okay. But as we go forward with this, it's very difficult. Uh, and one board member said last week when the CFO and I were having this discussion that it seems as if we don't know what's happening. And I said, in a sense, where we are right now is purely speculative and we're conjecturing about what it is that we can do, recognizing there's a amalgamation of ambiguities as a rest. So it feels as if I'm running around in circles trying to answer this question, but I have to be forthright. I can't say anything definitively at this time as we're still waiting on this guidance, but for certain, there are certain elements that we have to take into consideration as we look to prime ourselves on delivering service. And we do have an active recruitment campaign going on right now as we look to source candidates for our frontline positions. So when we are at a place where we need to leverage the service, 
um, in such a way, utilizing the information that we were just able to glean from our uh, service equity analysis that was done as prescribed uh, with guidance that we received from the FTA in relationship to service modifications that spawned out of the COVID pandemic. We're all trying to balance this as we go forward. So recognizing that there's a lot of things that are here. I would also say what's incumbent upon us too is this fair study and equity analysis that we must do as we go forward as well. It, it goes hand in hand with what I talked about, the service equity analysis and, and compliance with um, you know, the Title VI elements and Executive Order 12898, which is about environmental justice. So I know that was broad brush, but if you wanna ask me something more specific, I'll try to answer it, Rhett and, you know, and Rebecca smiling, it seems like I'm tap dancing and I'm really not. I just don't know how to answer your question and give you something forthright. <laughs> Well, I have to say that I always have the most problem with people that tell me 110% of what they know about something. <laughs> that other 10% can be a killer. So I, I appreciate the challenges that you're that you're dealing with there, Deborah. I wonder if you have any thoughts on uh, on the recovery of ridership post post. It's not post. A long way to go to post, but as the pandemic starts to at least in Colorado, get more and more under control. Do you have well, any feeling yet for that? Well, you know, I think it's important that we keep a pulse on what's happening in reference to activity centers opening up. I know I've had conversations with some external partners as relates to that, and we want to be at the forefront so we can have ample service. Now, keeping in mind that I touched upon the service equity analysis that we just completed. And when we look at those routes and looking at equity and non-equity communities, and for those that may not be familiar, um, in relationship to a service equity analysis, it's triggered when there's a 25% change in the service levels in which we're providing. So it's incumbent upon us to look at those routes that were impacted the most going forward to be in compliance with um, you know, the Civil Rights Act of 64 and the Title VI aspect for service equity and then the environmental justice piece. But I will share that a lot of those routes are the ones that we all, have, you know, are probably, you know, yearning towards to put back, um, when I say put back or at least have the service levels at a threshold that would help transport people to their activity centers. So that would be our guidepost as we go forward. Okay, well... Thank you for that. I appreciate it. You're welcome. Um, and I also appreciate how difficult it is to answer some of these questions when there's so much ambiguity. Yeah, hey, thank Rhett. you for that. Yes, Ron. Is Ron, do you mind if I follow up real quick? Uh, not a bit, please. Morning, Deborah. That that was helpful to me. And I appreciate appreciate that. I do have a, um, a question that might be helpful for the subcommittee. So as I understand it, sort of the, the run boards and the changes to service plans for RTD is sort of no small task, um, and which is why you only do them a few times a year. And I guess the question I have is, given, given how dynamic the situation may be over the next several months to a year, how, how adaptable can RT, RTD be to sort of add service to lines, uh, you know, if Luckily, a lot of us are getting vaccinated and more and more people are getting vaccinated. Businesses are starting to plan for returning to offices and workplaces, um, you know, starting starting this summer. Um, I got so my basic question is how how adaptable can RTD be? How quickly can RTD react to needs to add service to corridors um, as as ridership returns? Thank you very much, Ron. I believe that's a fair question. And when we talk about adaptability, let me just ask a qualifier. Are you asking outside of our standard service changes of which we have three a year? I'm, I'm, I'm asking, are those, do those opportunities exist to be adaptable enough to be able to adjust service levels outside of just the formal three run boards? Okay, got it. That's what I just wanted to see clarity on. So when we do service changes for all intents and purposes, we always stand back and reflect and discern whether or not the headways are appropriate, 
Um, do we need a different sort of combination of service that we need to provide in, in relationship to maybe optimizing efficiencies by inlining? And what I mean by inlining at a certain threshold, maybe another bus route becomes another bus route at a certain area. And so I think if anything, we have the opportunity to have discussion around that. I think the main issue in and of itself are having adequate resources in which to do that. And that gets back to our campaign right now relative to ensuring that we have, you know, operators and mechanics, operators on both sides, be they bus and light rail and commuter rail, so we can be more adaptable and flexible. Now, recognizing we don't know what lies ahead, but also recognizing what's been prescribed in relationship to the CRISA funding um, with the understanding that those could be used for salaries as we go forward. That's why we're looking to hire, but the one sort of rub with that, we're in the midst of a pandemic, so our training classes aren't gonna be as large as we'd like them to be because in the interest of full disclosure, at some of our facilities, they have been qualified as outbreak sites um, due to the fact that people have contracted COVID. So there is some limitations there, but we're trying to be flexible and agile as we ensure that we have adequate resources in play to be at the ready to deploy that service and adapt as we go forward and pivot. One other quick question, um, you know, it, under the con capacity constraints that the buses and the coaches, train coaches have right now, uh, it's something like 20% of the normal full capacity, uh, theoretical capacity for those buses and trains. Is, is there any uh, plan underway to, to decide when to reconsider uh, the restrictions on capacity? I'm smiling. You're a soothsayer. I didn't address that. But yes, as we look at where we are, let me share through our industry, the American Public Transportation uh, 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 Association, one of my colleagues actually took it upon himself and surveyed, uh, I want to say, 34 different transit properties as of late, and he shared the, his results. Some people are keeping them as is, some people have made modifications, but where we are as an organization, having spoken with my team and looking at where we are with the cases, recognizing that you know we really should be between 36 to 100 cases per 100,000 relative to the blue dial, and we were at 149 yesterday, you know, adjust, uh, addressing this with some trepidation. But with that as the backdrop, what we intend to do with the June service change is to increase capacity on our vehicles to 50%. Right now, they are not at 50%. Right. On our you know, buses, we have um, on our 30 footers, like 15 people, 40 footers, you know, we have 20 rail cars, it's 30. So we'll do 50% and we're gonna adjust that again, adjust, assess again come September, contingent upon what the environment looks like. So we are being flexible and adaptable as it relates to that, trying to ensure that we are providing a safe environment because we don't want to cut off our nose to spite our face, and then we have an outbreak. Um, so doing that in earnest. That's terrific. Glad to okay. hear. Okay, you. you're welcome. Has a big impact. It's hard to hard to manage when you've got all those follow along buses, and then suddenly your your ridership starts trying to increase. All right. Uh, does anybody have any other uh, comments on spending recommendations before we move on? Right, I'll leave her hand up. Okay. Um, so I guess thinking through, I mean, our report's gonna land in July and I'm just thinking about the changes that are gonna occur in the, particularly the COVID landscape between now and July. Our recommendations, which were great, sort of read as if they were in the, height of the pandemic as opposed to coming out of it. And so I think as there's more clarity about um, how CRISA dollars and other federal stimulus and recovery dollars um, can be spent, I think we might, I, I know that I'll be interested in saying to RTD, okay, you've de dealt with the rehiring, you've dealt with some of those sort of um, hair on fire um, urgent changes now we want you to, with the remaining dollars, look at our recommendations around partnerships, around increasing ridership, um, both to restore from COVID and go beyond. And um, I think that will be, by the time July comes rolling around, that's probably where I think I will be in terms of prioritizing our spending recommendations. Mm -hmm. So I guess- 
Alyssa, would, Alyssa can I ask you to look at look through this and make some suggestions in that regard? Um, sure. And I think, and I and I'll just preface that by saying I think some of our spending recommendations go directly to the other recommendations that we have in terms of substantive um, changes from operations and governance. Use some of these dollars to make those changes happen. Right. But I'm, I'd be happy to go through and um, sort of, I think, high grade for where I think we're going to be in July in terms of, of um, the recommendations that we need to be putting forth then. That would be very helpful. I don't want to put anything out there that really doesn't have any, any weight. And Dan and then Rebecca. Dan, did you have a comment? Yeah, Rep, thank you. Uh, on April 15th, the uh, Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment uh, suspended, um, I think, just about all of its code restrictions and deferred to the local public health officials to make decisions about capacity in restaurants and businesses. And uh, it also uh, suspended its restrictions on transit capacity, which were uh, limited 50% of seated capacity. So um, we are, you know, at, at RAFTA, we're kind of continuing with the 50% through our spring off season. And then when we get to this summer season, depending upon what's happening, we will maybe uh, add some capacity back in. We're not sure if we'll go to 100%, but uh, in some counties and some places, they're just opening everything up, including allowing masks to be optional. And of course, on the transit right now, we're under a federal mandate to have all passengers and employees wear masks. Yeah. So I think RTD uh, will have some flexibility uh, going forward to um, you know, add some capacity back in in consultation with their local public health departments. But you know, we don't want to do anything that is going to uh, potentially lead to people being exposed. Uh, yeah. One question I would have for Deborah is, if she has a, a handle on how many employees have gotten vaccinated at, at RTD. And also, as she starts to open up her services, what we're finding out is that uh, a lot of businesses are hiring and we're finding recruitment to be a lot more challenging uh, than it was during the height of the pandemic when people were looking for jobs. And, um, and, and she may be constrained to some extent by her a collective bargaining agreement in terms of what she can hire people on at and so forth. And we're having to look at all sorts of incentives to uh, attract people. So that could be a challenge for RTD as well. And I know maybe she's grappling with that and might want to give us a little bit of a, an overview of how staffing is going and what challenges she faces to get up to speed as things start to open up again. Hey, Deborah. Yeah, so thank you very much, Dan, for that. I appreciate your comments and you're spot on as it relates to where we are in the public health orders and basically most um, public health organizations are working collaboratively but give leeway to us. Hence, that's why we're looking at the 50% capacity on the bus with the June service change. So in relationship to where we are as it relates to vaccinations, recognizing that is a privacy issue what I can share, since we are providing incentives for individuals to get vaccinated, i.e., uh, we provided two hours of paid time off for each vaccination. So considering that we paid out that time, we've been able to discern what that looks like. So um, pursuant to the paid out data uh, for the incentives as related to April 15th, it appears that at least 50% of our workforce has been vaccinated. We have a myriad of different um, partnerships whereby we're leveraging uh, on-site vaccination events. Most specifically, um, we are having some vaccination uh, sites available uh, God, the week of May 3rd at four of our operating divisions for our third shift. For those that aren't familiar with third, uh, third shift, that can start anywhere from five o'clock and go up to five o'clock in the morning, since these individuals are typically sleeping during the day. And so basically with that event and another one that we have in conjunction with Kaiser April 24th and with the registrations, we anticipate that we could have 70, 75% of our workforce vaccinated um, by June. And so as we go forward and we talk about limitations as it relates to the CBA, I believe we, we have a good relationship with our collective bargaining um, 
unit and in turn working with leadership can nuance some elements that would look as if we were hamstrung, keeping in mind that adjustments were made back in April of 2020 would serve as outside of the typical uh, tenets of the collective bargaining agreement that prescribed when we should do a service change. So um, as relates to recruiting people, Dan, that's another important element because there could be some trepidation amongst people being in an environment in which they may not feel as secure. Um, so we are looking at options as we go forward. They're trying to be creative. And then the other piece of it you broached, oh yes, having workforce readily available, keeping in mind that we do have some outbreak sites. Once in fact, we find out somebody has COVID, then other people are out being quarantined. And that's where some of our issues have rest because when we look at the ready number of frontline employees being available to pull out for service, some of that may be impacted. Hence, that's why we could miss a run or drop a trip. Um, that's why we want to ensure that we have ample people on board and have a relative extra board so we can touch back and have people readily available to ensure that we are, we are meeting our service commitment um, as prescribed with our schedules. So I hope that addresses your questions. Sounds like it did. Rebecca? Uh, thanks, Chair. I, I was just going to echo what Elise said and, and offer to help. I, I think we, we don't, um, you know, we do a bit of a disservice to our recommendations if we don't make them uh, better, best reflect the, the moment in time we'll be in in July, which I hope is a different place. But also the, also the fact that is the point I was trying to make earlier that we're talking about, an, you know, an additional large amount of money and um, trying to focus our recommendations on, on recognizing that. So just a, an offer of help and, and to support Elise. Great, thank you for that. All right, we have a long agenda. So let's, uh, let's move ahead. Next item is RTD dashboard recommendation. Um, we, have, we have a really just sort of an initial, very uh, slender, um, list of, of things that would go into that. Uh, Rebecca, I don't know how much you've had a chance to look at this particular piece of paper, uh, but I, I do think there's, before, before we dive into it too deep, I wanted to make a couple of comments. I think a one page budget is, is not enough. It is enough for a budget. It isn't enough for an explanation of the budget. I think there needs to be an accompanying page that says, here is what all of this means. And here's, here's what base system versus, uh, you know, th th things like fast tracks, uh, you know, two different divisions, operations, and then, and then what you're building on right there. It's the terminology in there that they'll not have a clue about. And uh, so it, it would be useful if there's also a, a page that explains uh, how, to, how to understand it for the less uh, engaged groups. Uh, the other thing is there's a, a document that RTD produces called service performance that is a very important document to understand how all of the different lines in RTD are, are performing and how RTD is performing overall as well and what some of their challenges are. And um, Ron knows about this and knows the links to it, but I also think while you don't want to incorporate necessarily that whole document all the time, at least links to it because there's so much valuable detail information for those people that want to dive into that. And we'll have some that fall in that category. Okay, with that, I open the floor to everybody else. And Rebecca, do you think you can take this initial uh, discussion and kind of flesh it out a little more as you might feel that we need to. It, it should, we should have it in a form where we can easily turn it into a recommend draft into a recommendation. I, I, I certainly can, Rod, and I, I um, totally agree with your comment on, on having kind of a reader's explanation of the budget. I think that'd be very important. Yeah. So I'm, I'm happy to do that. Great. All right. At least I ask that, the made, time frame? that made larger. Is that too small on the screen? No, it, I see it pretty well. It's always better to make it larger, though. 
And and Rebecca, apologies. Was it try? I was I was just trying to capture some of the conversations over the last couple of meetings and just get some words down on paper so that as a skeleton, so y'all can just put some meat on the bones. No, that's very helpful. Um, Chair, what is your time frame for wanting to, to start to flush these things out into recommendations? I think at, the, much last, with, at the next time we meet, I think we need to be ready to say, these are our recommendations for a lot of areas. There's some, there are a few areas where we won't be, but I think by the next meeting we should be. Now that also involves the operations committee and potentially the accountability committee as well. But in terms of the ones that are finance related that are coming from this committee, certainly on, on the dashboard, I'd like to be absolutely done with that. Seems like a reasonable expectation. The same thing is true for the ones we looked at on, on financial information. Uh, it would be good to say, to be able to put something before the, the whole finance committee and say, are we ready to approve these? And, and there, there's a whole other set that, that have to do with some of the other research that uh, myself and others have been working on. Okay, any other comments? Then we shall move on to Northwest Rail Corridor. I'm happy to say from RTD, we have uh, Henry Stoppelkamp and we also have Bill Van Meter, I saw it, has joined us as well. So I'll turn it over to Henry and Bill. Okay. Presentation on the Northwest Rail Corridor that was part of the RTD board discussions on that subject. Okay, so what I'd like to do, if I may, is take control of the screen. But I can't share, you cannot share, start sharing screen while others is sharing. So I need somebody to drop off what you have. Okay. And hey, Rudd, Elise and Rebecca both have their hands raised. I don't know if it's an accident. Do you have something um, you want to say? No, sorry, that was from prior. Okay. Let's, oh, okay. Yeah, he actually got the screen. I couldn't, we couldn't figure that out when I was trying to do it. <laughs> so I think I've got to pull your screen. Is that correct? You do. We are looking at your at your board of directions discussion item. Perfect page. So what I'd like to do, uh, we'll we'll zap through this relatively quickly. This is the uh, presentation that was made to the RTD board of directors back on April six. Uh, several of the board members are on this call. So is General Manager Johnson. So. Uh, I'm gonna do a slight modification. I'm also gonna put a little bit of narrative on what came up as part of the discussion. And uh, we'll go through it relatively quickly and then uh, open it up for discussions. And there's enough folks on the call to uh, hopefully answer all your questions. So the first page is basically the discussion item that goes along with the PowerPoint. And I'm using your version, your meeting minutes to go forward. So. Northwest Rail uh, from the April 6th, both uh, Bill Van Meter and, and myself uh, provided the uh, presentation to the board. And so uh, we started off with uh, uh, th this relatively busy slide, but uh, the intent of the slide is to show all aspects that tie into uh, determining the impacts associated with peak service and uh, what it will take to come up with um, an overall cost to determine what it takes to make a peak service uh, viable. So on the left-hand side, uh, the will of the people in orange, uh, you got the fast tracks vote, you've got uh, board, board engagement, stakeholder engagement, reaching out to local elected officials, local municipalities. Um, so that's the genesis of this whole process. And then down below in silver, we've got the uh, planning and approval aspect we're gonna to have to relook at the travel forecasting. Uh, we need to work with the FTA, FRA. Uh, we're working with the uh, Front Range um, pa Passenger Association, uh, to developing an MOU uh, for joint uh, collaboration for the uh, Denver Union Station North portion. Uh, gonna talk with the emergency responders, United States Army Corps of Engineers, 
Over on the gold side, we've got the operational side that we need to look at. Uh, we're going to look at the full service and the peak service because one of the goals we've got is not to um, hamper the full service concept. Uh, so we don't want to do anything that precludes it. Uh, we're going to look at the peak service operating plan, vehicle technology, location for a maintenance facility. What do our vehicles look like, the O&M, the staffing, and who's going to operate the system? Uh, is it going to be a Denver Transit operator? Uh, is it going to be, or DTP, or is it going to be RTD or some other entity? Uh, in purple, we're looking at uh, the project delivery for taking uh, not only the initial uh, getting a consultant on board to answer questions, but what would it take to uh, implement a program going forward? Uh, we're looking at the agreements that we need with the municipalities, uh, the funding sources, and we're talking a little bit about funding, property rights, what additional properties need it, uh, and the appropriate staffing levels to get us through the study phase, and then what do we need after that? And then up above in green, you get the BNSF, I think everybody is aware that this is going to be one of the few corridors that are actually will be the only corridor that we will be operating on somebody else's uh, right away and tracks. Um, so what are, what do the agreements look like? What additional right away does the BNSF need? Signalization, positive train control. Who's going to maintain the corridor and uh, passing track locations? And then off to the far uh, left hand side, we got the funding and. Uh, we're throwing all this out there. Uh, this exercise will not determine the funding source uh, going forward. We're really looking at what will it take, uh, dollar amount, the impacts. So this slide you'll see several times in the PowerPoint presentation, but realizing you can't uh, answer the question, what will it take without all these other elements? So we wanted to capture them. We could have put them on several slides, but we decided to try to put it all in one uh to uh go through it so um one of the big things that we realized that uh when we started this process uh the fast tracks vote went in 2004 but there were several studies that were done that framed the fast tracks program the major investment study of 2001 the fast tracks plan we looked at the diagonal uh feasibility in 05 worked on the environmental process up through uh, 2010. And in 2010, uh, we came up with the environmental evaluation, the overall uh, report that uh, outlined the impacts. Uh, we did not have funding at that point. Uh, in 2011, we did reach out to the BNSF based on the environmental evaluation and they developed detailed plans uh, what it would take to double track and provide service to the corridor. And um, so they came up with numbers in 2013. Price per mile, not a bad deal. Uh, the problem is we needed another 35 more miles. So uh, the price got more than we had. Uh, in 2013, the uh, corridor stakeholders along with RTD uh, did the NAM study, the Northwest Area Mobility Study, looking at what the impacts are and how to make the project go forward. Uh, still didn't have funding in 2016, so the question was, how do we mitigate, uh, reduce the overall cost uh, to the BNSF and the corridor? And that's where the peak service uh, concept emerged. And uh, we looked at running three trains in in the morning, three trains out in the morning, doing the same thing in the evening, and realized that if we did bi-directional, uh, would require a double track scenario. So then we ratcheted it down to three trains from Longmont in the morning to Denver, and then uh, Denver to Longmont in the evening. Uh, since then, we've had technology challenges and what has changed along the corridor, demographics. And we also have now the potential of additional uh, partners with the front range and Amtrak uh, operations. So where does that take us? So real quick, peak service concept. Uh, the one we're looking at is the three trips in the morning uh, from Lama to Denver, return trip. We currently have six miles in operations from Denver to Westminster. In Westminster, we're looking at the 76, uh, 72nd station uh, with remains 35 miles remaining up to Longmont. 
Travel time is somewhere about 60 to 70 minutes, depending on number of stations, the vehicle technology that we're going to end up with, and any modifications we do to the BNSF alignment to smooth out some of the uh, curvatures and increase track speed. And this operation, we are still looking at diesel technology uh, going forward. So partners and regional collaboration. Uh, we've got the uh, corridor. So the community is on the corridor. We've got the BNSF, US Army Corps of Engineers. Uh, we're not looking at federal funding at this point, but we're not trying to, we're going to try to do stuff that will not mitigate uh, potential federal funding later on. But uh, the Army Corps steps in on wetlands and environmental clearance. Then we have the FTA and FRA, along with CDOT and the Front Range Passenger Rail Commission. Um, so that's the northern portion, leaving Denver, going through Boulder and up through Longmont. And then uh, Amtrak has uh, a desire to operate the front range passenger operations and provide service through the corridor as well. So we did have an extensive outreach. Uh, C C o GM and CEO Johnson, myself and Bill Van Meter met with uh, six groups of individuals along the corridor, uh, virtual, uh, started on uh, March 15th. And we had some uh, common themes that we heard from the corridors. Uh, number one, frustration. Everybody's paid into the Fast Tracks program, but there's still no Northwest Rail. Uh, that was not a shock. Uh, one of the things that uh, we heard from the corridors, uh, they want a, a schedule. They want a list of activities that need to be completed in order to give us answers. Uh, so they're looking for a completion timeline schedule. Uh, they threw out there the peak service and BRT along 119, Highway 7 and 287 are not interchangeable with a full rail build out. It's not an either or. Um, they also went into strategic investments and interests, uh, mobility along the corridor, BRT and rail. Um, one of the things that we heard loud and clear that uh, the corridor believes that uh, uh, we should be leveraging the FISA account to fund the 30% plans and the environmental work going forward and a request for the RTD board to support the BNSF alignment as the preferred front range alignment. So then that throws back to the slide that uh, we've already talked about. Uh, these elements are the contributing uh, elements to the overall study. What do we need? What elements uh, need to be evaluated? And how much detail do we want to go into the various uh, topics? So we present it to the board, we being the RTD staff, basically uh, three scenarios for a path going forward, options going forward, uh, level one, two, and three. Uh, original thinking on that, but uh, really it is level one, two, and three. Uh, we deal with the environmental and the planning review, uh, the engineering and project development, uh, level of community engagement, a time frame, and funding needs to make this happen. So uh, I'm just going to go down each group. Uh, and uh, if we start with the planning and environmental review, uh, if the first level one is taking the uh, 2010 plans, uh, going forward and assuming that's what we are designing for with peak service on 2010 uh, uh, evaluation. Uh, we'd be dusting off the BNSF plans from 11 through 13, uh, identify where the sightings need to be done, update some of the engineering work, very low level of community engagement. Uh, one of our concerns was it's disingenuous for us to go out and get community engagement and listen and then the community thinks that we're gonna go ahead and change the environmental and change the plans. Uh, that's the big difference between the level one and level two, uh, because level one is basically just taking what we know and going forward. Timeline for that is uh, 12 to 18 months, two and a half to $5 million to do that. Uh, the level two is really high community engagement, listening to what's changed over the last, uh, basically, 16 to 20 years uh, through this corridor, uh, look at the travel modeling, the ridership, the ADT at the at-grade crossings, noise and vibration, 
what are the concerns of the communities? Um, and that basically is cyclical. Um, they provide information. We put that in the environmental, we clear it, we update the uh, engineering work, uh, revisit technology, still diesel, but is it a push pull DMU? What else is out there? Uh, this process, uh, 18 to 24 months, somewhere between five and $10 million. We are going forward and uh, this is kind of the, the area that the board suggested that we focus on, uh, realizing that uh, this will dust off the 2010. We don't want to get too far down the line because we still don't have a funding strategy. The level three would basically uh, redo 100% of what was done in 2010. Uh, look at all the assets, the assumptions, uh, station location, technology. Uh, do we electrify the entire corridor? What does that look like? Uh, and the environmental process and communication would be a very high level. Uh, that's an eight to $13 million uh, price tag on a three year process. Uh, so the scope of work, uh, we're looking at to formulate a communication plan, uh, develop uh, the major tasks, the dependencies, the timelines that everybody wanted to see, look at the staffing. Identi the big one here is identifying the risk and the mitigation that we need to do to the uh, stakeholders, to the BNSF for RTD, how does that all tie in? Um, and then solicit uh, a or or solicit a proposal uh, with the uh, municipalities involved uh, going forward uh, to find a firm that can identify the uh, the risk and the mitigation and overall cost. So our next steps is to formulate scope of work over the next couple months. Uh, we've got a kickoff meeting with the. So we met with the stakeholders on March 8th, uh, 15th, and then uh, later on that week. Uh, going forward, we are meeting with uh, the staff members that participated on those meetings on the 26th, which is next Monday. Um, we've started working on our internal PMP, project management plan. Uh, we are looking at uh, a, a frame, framework on the overall scope of work. But we want a detailed schedule, planning requirements, which elements that we need to look at, engineering levels. Uh, we met with BNSF, Front Range uh, Passenger Operation or Passenger Association, Amtrak, two days ago. Uh, they, they are all invested in looking at operating plans that uh, work not only for them, but RTD going north from Denver Union Station out. Uh, BNSF has indicated that they are. Uh, willing to take on some of the engineering work and the modeling work. Now it's not free, but the advantage of them doing that work is when it's all said and done, they can say, yes, we've looked at it. This is the price, this is the impacts. If we had hire a third party to do that, then the BNSF still has to review, approve, and that adds time and money to the overall exercise. Um, and then the goal is to come back uh, with the recommendation to use the FISA account to fund this effort. So developing that scope of work will determine whether it's a $5 million value or an $8 million value. So we'll shrink that down to uh, re realistic numbers, uh, realizing that uh, the, uh, the slide that you saw up here uh, was a three week, uh, I mean, we had three weeks to put it together based on the original presentation we gave to the board. So uh, we're hoping to uh, dial in on the funding needs and the overall time frame. And then uh, with that, we ended up with questions to the board, uh, bottom line, uh, comments back and forth, and I, I'll open up for Ms. Johnson and the board members, but uh, was the, uh, desire to go with the level two uh, valuation. And uh, that's where Bill staff, my staff are working together uh, to come up with a uh, scope of work, overall budget and schedule going forward. So in a nutshell, that's where we're at. So uh, Ms. Johnson, would you like to add anything else to the presentation or Mr. Van Meter? 
Uh, no, thank you very much, Mr. Stoffelkamp. I think you covered it. And one thing I just want to iterate that this is enabling us as we go forward to have a common set of facts so we all can speak in finite points as opposed to ambiguity about what it is that we can do to shore up this rail, um, the lack of rail up in the Northwest. So thank you very much, Henry. I think you did an awesome job. So with that, Bill, you want to add anything else or open up to questions? Nothing more to add. I think that was a good summary. Thank you, Henry. Okay, let's open it up for questions. Well, I'll, I'll start the discussion. Um, it's no secret that I've been really skeptical about the $708 million and 800 passenger 1600 boardings model and what that implies in terms of cost. And, uh, and it, I, I just have not been able to come to grips with, with how much it would cost to put this together. We're not building any new rail. We're still just using the existing rail and, uh, and how all that would work out. I, I know there are a lot of discussions going on uh, between Amtrak and Front Range Passenger Rail as to exactly what they're going to be doing. And I'll talk a little bit about that later on. But uh, if it is, one of the things that I've heard that I thought was quite interesting, and I'll raise it now, is the idea of doing a, uh, a shorter um, sort of demonstration rail. And if that were, if they chose this route and they use that Boulder Denver segment as their demonstration project, it would really create a way where potentially uh, federal funding would be available to build a lot of the rails, which really opens up the opportunity for front range passenger rail as originally designed and promised to the people in the corridor. And so, I, you know, it's, it's still early discussions. It's so much ambiguity in, in all the things Northwest Passenger Rail is talking about and thinking about and what, uh, what the perceptions uh, are at DOT and, and uh, the sources of federal funding uh, from, through Amtrak or, or whatever. Um, I, my, con my concern is if we, if we if we spent a little more, maybe the better thing to do was, would be to invest not just in this evaluation of this, but in the evaluation of the whole Northwest Rail project and, and trying to nail those numbers down. Because that's where a lot of the focus remains, for example, from the governor, is that Northwest Rail, very strong uh, proponent there. and and no matter what you feel about that, we're, we're dealing with a lot of ambiguity in the whole Northwest Rail project in terms of what it would cost and uh, uh, more importantly, how it would come together and what some of the environmental challenges would be for that. Uh, I'm a little concerned with the diesel. I'm more than a little concerned with building something that's really focused on diesel that doesn't create any new pathways, uh, any new tracks. And spending 708, I know that's a preliminary estimate, but you know, if you're talking about 800 passengers, it's approaching a million dollars a passenger to provide that service. And so um, I find it hard to support that model unless somebody will convince me the economics I've done are just totally wrong. And I am open to anybody that wants to say, hey, you're out of your mind, you forgot this or that. And you got copies of of, uh, of the agenda and, and all of that's in there, and uh, I, I I just I just struggle with how that would be the best investment. And if and if that can't be resolved, then spending the FISA funds on on this evaluation as opposed to going ahead and doing the evaluation of the whole Northwest Rail would seem like spending a little more in in looking at the big project. Uh, maybe a better use of funds. That's just me talking. It's not the RTD accountability. It, 
subcommittee and it's not even the RTD finance subcommittee. But I really do have concerns about uh, using that FISA money and, and only looking at this limited thing. I would step up and say, if you're gonna access that, uh, spend more money and do the whole Northwest Rail evaluation. And a concept for consideration. And in that you'd also wind up doing more outreach, which I think is a real critical thing in, in this whole thing. Um, anybody else wanna speak? Well, sure, although I, if RTD wants to respond to yeah. more concerns about costs, I'm happy to wait and let them do that. Looks Anybody like Bill does. You want to call me out on, on that? And I, I am really open to, yeah, you're wrong about this because I'm not married to, to these concepts. I just, I just want some help to understand it better. Lynn, did you raise a hand? I think Bill has his hand hand oh, okay. up. Hi, Bill. Thanks for being with us. Thanks. I don't want to wade into um, some of the issues you're talking about, but I just want to make sure we're we're clear. I mean, physically, this level two study that the board gave us direction to proceed with is the full Northwest Rail corridor in terms of its physical extents. It's focused just on Northwest Rail, Longmont to Denver Union Station. And if you were talking about service levels, then I, I see where you're going because um, what we are looking at under this proposal will be focused primarily on that peak service plan. But I just wanted to make sure that was clear because it, it wasn't quite clear there. And, and you know, um, to one of the things Henry spoke to, it, we will have much more confidence in what that the scope of that project will look like, its costs, um, uh, we'll be able to revisit um, the travel markets and ridership and, and those sorts of metrics as a, a part of this. And I just wanted to make sure that was clear. Well, since it, you're looking at the whole corridor, Bill, how much different would it be if you, if you focused more on the whole Northwest Rail instead of just the, this part of the service? How much impact would that, would that I'll, have? I'll take a stab and then Henry will um, fill in the blanks, but um, for the full service scenario, 50 plus trips a day, round trip operations um, from early morning through late evening, it's a pretty significant difference in impacts. It would require double tracking the whole corridor. Um, yeah. That has some significant engineering challenges and impacts. Um, which is why the costs are um, noticeably higher because the whole quarter design is substantially around that single track operation. And so it adds a lot of different impacts in terms of community impacts, noise and vibration, cost impacts, and the like. Um, I'll let Henry embellish a little if he'd like. Before we go on, one question. When you said double tracking, does that include going all the way up to um, Longmont with double tracks because the original proposal was single track that yeah um, and Henry can clarify okay thanks so, Henry? yeah so the original proposal was double track to Boulder single track from Boulder to Longmont uh, BNSF's model it based on the operating scenario uh, they believe it's going to take a double track from Longmont all the way into Denver so or to uh, 72nd where we tie in right now so uh, the peak service is going to require about four siding locations and upgrading the corridor to a PTC system. Uh, it's a dark territory, which means the signalization uh, is a uh, track warrant. So the train gets on, talks to dispatcher, say, I, I need permission to get on the track. I'm traveling from here to there. And so it's a radio communication back and forth. If we're gonna get out there, it has to be PTC. Uh, the, so the whole corridor does get, tracks don't get modified, but the signal system and protection of the tracks get modified. We had the four crossings in there, uh, potentially upgrading uh, some of the at-grade crossings. Uh, 
out there. And then the stations, park and rides are all part of that. So that's what we're clearing right now with a, uh, I know you don't like the concept of diesel and I'm not a fan of diesel, uh, but with the, the length of the corridor, uh, when we did the original modeling, uh, the payback uh, did not make sense for uh, electrification. Also, there was some big concerns originally going through Boulder open space with the uh, visual impacts. Uh, so that's one of the things that uh, on the environmental side we really have to look at. So the full build out, if we were gonna do double track the whole way, clear that, um, that's where we do get a significant uh, increase in overall cost. Um, not saying it can't be done, uh, but it really, uh, if we're gonna open up the environmental and reevaluate what was out there, we had to look at station locations, are they still in the right locations? Um, what, what have we got for the at-grade crossings? Uh, the travel shed, the uh, ADT on the at-grade crossing, some of that has probably uh, not those crossings up to a great separation. Uh, so what do the great separations look like? What are the impacts of the communities around those intersections? Uh, that's the, that would be the phase two or scenario, not two, but three scenario. Uh, so there's a lot of, of time and energy to look at that, not saying it can't be done. Uh, but right now, since we're only looking at peak service, uh, a lot of that stuff does not need to be addressed to provide peak service. So if you're talking about uh, peak service, if you did the whole study that you're that you're discussing, and then later on uh, the funding was found or whatever to do the entire corridor double track as as we talk, as we we've discussed, then what would uh, I'm sure some of the work that you do would be of use, but it would it, it seems like you'd have to start over and really do a a lot of, a lot more work and a lot more comprehensive study to get there, which translates into more delay and actually completing a Northwest rail. So, so if I may, uh, our goal is to minimize the amount of work that is disposable or thrown away. Yeah. So uh, as we're going forward, I'll use the at-grade crossings, for example. Uh, we will be looking at what it takes to, if, if we're gonna modify an at-grade crossing, and we're only going to have one track through there, but potentially a, six, a double track at a later date. We will go ahead and design it, associate with that concept. So we'll have a bigger signal bungalow that can handle the double track. We'll run the conduit from the first set of gates to where the second gate, second gates would go. Uh, so we'll design that stuff in at, at the very beginning. If we're not touching an accurate crossing, we won't deal with it. Uh, but anything that we do on that side, we'll look at it. Uh, the PTC signal system, where we put the sidings, the turnouts, uh, all that will be designed in such a way that we can go ahead and just add to it and turn that into a double track system. So the sidings, for example, we're looking at mile and a half to two mile long sidings. Uh, we'll design it in such a way that we can just turn that into a double track scenario. Um, the noise and vibration where we're impacting right now will have cleared for it. Um, so most of the work that we're gonna do should not be uh, throwaway. Uh, it gives us an understanding of what we need to continue to study uh, on the environmental and the engineering work. Bill, you wanna add anything more to that? Before you do, Bill, the, the one thing I don't get is if, if we did this, if we built this out, the sightings and 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 the crossings and all those other things, uh, we would have two, we would have two sets of tracks separate from where the Burlington Northern Santa Fe is. Maybe not really a long way off, but it would be they would be separated from that, wouldn't they? No, we're 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 going to run on the BNSF. So the side. But I'm talking about if we ever do Northwest Rail. We're, we're if operating. Northwest on... Rail is new rails. No. So you would take over the BNSF for Northwest Rail? We would share the BNSF. So it'd be a double track system. They would do all the maintenance. They would do the construction and it'd be bi-directional. 
So main one would be the northbound track, main two would be southbound. And you slide in the freight traffic in between our traffic. Huh. I thought I, I, my conception was that we actually would be building some new rail. No, so there, there, there is no rail for northwest, northwest rail too. Yeah. Okay, well, that's helpful. Thank you very much, Henry. Bill, can you? Yeah, just to clarify, we would be building new rail, but as to Henry's point, it would be shared um, by both passenger and freight operations. We'd be building the second, well, they would be building the second track, it'd be theirs, we'd be paying for it, and we would have access to it on, under that situation. So on Henry's main one, main two, um, with temporal separation, we would have passenger and freight rail on the same corridor. And yeah, um, Hen Henry's point definitely is um, spot on for uh, the capital improvements. The intent would be that anything we did for the peak service as much as possible at least would still be valuable and reusable and added to, not replaced when we um, build to a, a more robust service in the full service scenario. The um, environmental work and engineering work, much of that would need to be redone because the environment, I'm presuming um, we would be down so far down the road, just as we are today, 10 years, 11 years since we finished our environmental documentation, that it's stale developments and the environment have changed and we would need to reanalyze unless it happened quickly. So that would be an argument against doing that work now without the confidence that we could find 1.5 to 1.7 billion to build the whole thing. Yeah, yeah. And also the time delays associated with having to redo it. Uh, I re recognize those are difficult things to evaluate and political things to evaluate as well. There are a lot of ways you could be delayed and building that. Could I jump in with some questions, Rhett? Sure, you bet. Thanks. So I guess just the conversation that we're having now, uh, I, I think that the folks from the Northwest Quarter always saw peak rail as starter service, um, that its purpose was not, was not a be all and end all. It was um, temporary until you got to full Northwest Rail build out. And I guess I'm curious if RTD sees that in the same light. I mean, there would be some utility at least in understanding in um, general terms what the overall cost of Northwest Rail was and the overall projected ridership potential would be um, so that you would know ultimately what the end game is before you start down the path of investing in a starter service of Northwest Rail. What, what is RTD's perspective on that? You're, you're absolutely right. Uh, that, that's kind of the way we're looking at it too. This is a phase one. Um, and so, you know, a, as we move out, we figure out commuter rail maintenance facility. Uh, I'm not gonna buy a piece of property that only handles a uh, starter service. Uh, I'm gonna look at a piece of property that can be expanded to handle an entire fleet. Um, we're looking at uh, what are the improvements to the BNSF corridor. So we know, we, we hired the BNSF years ago to design it and show us what it would take. So there are areas in there that we know where we need additional right away. Uh, the question for us right now is, is, is it still available or do we need to go with walls to stay within the right of way? Um, so our goal would be to add to it as funding and ridership dictates. Or I should, I should say as ridership dictates and we had the funding available to do it. And the board gives us the direction to make, make those the decisions. Okay. Well, let me sw switch then. Um, is the, all of this work, the study, would that be also equally necessary and complementary to the front range passenger rail process so that we're not doing something that, that may not work for front range passenger rail? It does seem like that that's the most likely um, scenario to get capital funding 
to complete Northwest Rail anytime before we're all dead. Um, so I'm just curious whether or not this, this process that you're outlining would integrate with any Front Range Passenger Rail investigation and implementation. Our goal is yes. And I'll let Commissioner Bill Van Meter of the Front Range Passenger Rail Association answer a little bit more. <laughs> You're on, Bill. <laughs> Thanks, Henry. Yeah. So, um, Thanks, you know, the, the commission has expressed its general intent for that to be the case. The RTD Board of Directors have also expressed similar interest, and to that end, we are working actively on an MOU a cooperation agreement between potentially three parties, actually, the Department of Transportation, if um, they're um, willing to be signatories and their staff have indicated interest in supporting that, um, RTD and the commission. To that end, um, Elise, um, to, towards um, making sure that our plans, our investments, our operations and capital improvements are complementary, not competitive, um, to the potential benefit of, of all three parties. And so that cooperation agreement kind of is in a staff review at, at the moment, and I anticipate it'll be going um, between before different bodies um, for consideration in the coming in the coming months. I, I have a question on, along the, okay, go ahead, Henry. I just want to throw, throw one thing out there that uh, we met as a group in person uh, on Tuesday, or maybe it was Monday, a couple days ago, uh, <laughs> I, that was Monday, uh, with the BNSF, the Front Range Passenger Association, uh, Amtrak, who will probably be operating on the BNSF territory forum. Uh, but we sat down and we talked about the challenges as far as operating plans. How do we tie in? How does the Front Range, how does it all look together, work together? Uh, how does the BNSF remain still competitive in the corridor for moving freight? So uh, BNSF is going to put together a joint operating plan uh, from input from all the parties uh, to look at that corridor. And that will also dictate where do we need the passing tracks, what improvements are needed, how the stations are configured. Uh, so we had that kickoff on Monday of this week. So we are moving forward down that path. Good. Good. Yeah, I, one of my recommendations in, in the work that I'm doing is absolutely you should continue to nourish and try to develop that partnership because I, I don't see where the money is going to come just to build it independently. I, I would also say that there are two two different systems that are being discussed. One is the is the high speed rail. And the high speed rail absolutely would require a different set of tracks or or at least a replacement of all those tracks. So there's there's a and and that would probably also require some additional um, environmental studies and, and things of that nature. So, Lynn, did I see you raise your hand at some point in all this? <laughs> if, that's, if that's a no, that's fine. I don't feel like, I'm not trying to be on the spot. Uh, you did this time see me raise my hand. Yes, thanks, Rhett. <laughs> okay. um, and uh, um, thanks, Henry and Bill. I thought it was a, a great presentation again. You know, my, I think these are all good questions. My understanding for one thing, you know, from Henry and Bill in our meetings earlier is that they have a better sense, a, a much higher confidence level in this work that's been done on the full build out than what a starter service would look like. And I, I don't wanna, Bill and Henry know this much better than I do, but um, you know I think that, that a lot of what Front Range Passenger Rail and others are looking at is sort of a starter service of some sort as well. Um, you know I think from our perspective, you know on the board and and at RTD, uh, the moment is here because of what you're talking about with Front Range Passenger Rail, and and it's great to hear that we have the MOU underway and and uh, all of those things, and you know uh, Amtrak. There's uh, $80 billion in the infrastructure bill that 
President Biden has um, included. That's more, the, typically the annual federal uh, don contribution to Amtrak is $2 billion. So they're clearly looking at opening up um, new areas and, and ours is an area that they keep talking about quite a bit. So in terms of, uh, you know, Elisa's um, statement about, uh, you know that this is this is maybe our chance to get money in the next few decades. Uh, the Amtrak the infrastructure bill it may come down. You know this is nothing that's that's final yet, but um, it really does open a, a kind of a window of opportunity. I think that the board wanted to um, move forward and take advantage of. I think that's true. So, Elise, any other comments? Questions? I was at this question for Henry and what you just had said about talking with BNSF. What I've been uh, not uh, clear about is how their future may be changing given their freight operations changing over time and whether or not they're giving you any glimpse into that. It seemed that Back when we passed fast tracks, they thought passenger rail would would be a nice complement. Not too late, you know, a few years passed, and then freight became uh, seemingly much more important to them than the idea of doing any passenger um, rail collaboration. And the rumor then was it had to do with um, a lot of freight involved with uh, the oil and gas boom. Um, and I'm just curious if we have a sense of what's the next chapter for BNSF in terms of their freight capability as certainly the our energy future is changing. I don't know what else, uh, how they see their freight and whether or not you have any sense on that. that that's an awesome question. Um, and so uh, for those that don't know, I, I came from BN years and years ago. And in the 90s, the goal was to sell that corridor. Nobody wanted to buy the corridor. And then the uh, coal fields opened up. Uh, and that changed everything. <clears throat> Coals changed a little bit, but then the power for the, uh, the oil fields and moving sand and oil. Um, BNSF's modeled the corridor. Uh, they believe it's going to be about a 10% increase per year uh, going forward. So uh, somewhere around 10 to 15 trains a day uh, with the local trains. And a lot of local services actually dropped off. Uh, but that's, that adds a train a, a year, year. So, uh, you know, in 10 years, that's 10 extra trains. Uh, personally, I think that's a little bit optimistic, uh, but that's what they're modeling. So uh, their, their bottom line and, and their outline for passenger operations, their guiding principles, as they call it, uh, basically says no harm to BNSF. So they model in the, the, the presentation they gave us in Fort Worth a year ago in February, showed that increase and it wasn't quite 10 trains. I think they added seven trains uh, and it showed how we could slide in there and operate our system. So it really comes down to when do we have those discussions with them and what's going on in the industry? So yes, you're right. The, uh, with the fracking, everything went up, said, okay, no more. Uh, then the fracking went down and okay, we got capacity. So it's a basically a crime of opportunity. If we catch them when it's not a major uh, ma major freight boom, we got a chance. If it's a freight boom, then we're going to pay extra on that. Uh, but the one thing that everybody has to realize on the BNSF corridor, uh, this is their primary connection between Fort Collins and Denver. And so if they're bringing commodities into Denver, they need to go north to Fort Collins through Wyoming, the coal fields, and then up into uh, Montana for the High Line connection. Uh, they, they need this alignment and they utilize it. Uh, it's also the overflow. Uh, right now, some of the traffic goes all the way out to Alliance, Nebraska, and then back into Denver instead of coming straight down. Uh, they do have operating rights on the Union Pacific Railroad from Fort Collins down, but operating rights means you pay a premium to operate on somebody else's uh, territory. Uh, so they would rather not pay UP anything because it's their competition. Uh, 
so the operational uh, analysis changes year to year on the corridor. Uh, our, that's one reason if we can get the BNSF to make a commitment, uh, at least we know it's their commitment, not a third party's assumption. And that's one of the reasons for uh, Rutten, your, your com comment about the uh, $700 million. That does seem high, uh, but without getting true numbers from BNSF, uh, RTD and nobody on the corridor wanted to commit to the actual dollar amount. Uh, we, I personally bring it, bring, believe it should come down, uh, but without the input from the BNSF and their numbers, uh, we've seen over from 2000 to today, numbers go up and down. Uh, before the vote, the number on the corridor was relatively low. We put that number into the fast tracks uh, plan and shortly afterwards, uh, operations changed and that number went up. Also look at the price of real estate uh, through Boulder, uh, for example, we pay over the fence value plus a 30% uh, a corridor enhancement factor. So the right of way along the corridor has increased significantly uh, since 21, uh, tw 2001, I should say. And so when we take the original uh, assessment, uh, those values have gone through the roof. Uh, for anybody that owns property in the front range, you know that uh, what we thought would never go up, uh, well, we thought it'd go up a little bit, but uh, I can't afford to buy the house I'm living in right now. Um, no. Heard that, I've heard that story. I've also recalled the impact on the estimates going from 570 million or whatever to going to 1.5 to 1.7 billion. That's 2018 dollars for building Northwest Rail. A big part of that was the BNSF, uh, the the cost of right of way and the access to right of way going up. But you know there are also materials and. And uh, there are a lot of other things that went into it, but that was a big one. And I, I am concerned by that ambiguity. If the economy really recovers, then BS, BNSF may be moving, moving more, uh, more materials. But you know, there's still the oil and gas industry, which is not doing great right now. So there, there's so many. Uh, hey, I don't, Chris, this is Chris, real fast. Don't envy your challenge. Yes, Chris. I I just would add that construction costs don't go down. Yeah. Yep. So I, I, I would I'm, now, I'm now in year 35 in this industry. They, they just don't go down. <laughs> yeah. And we're probably, I would think, I, I can't imagine how we would get this rail built in less than 20 years and delivered and operating. It is, it is still, no matter what we do in terms of where the funding comes from, there's a lot of hurdles to jump here. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I guess I, I do understand all that. And I think it's interesting. I don't quite understand what the role is to the to the accountability committee. But I think one thing I, I would say is the flip side of that is not doing it means it will cost more the next time because of that cost always going up. So the longer we go without doing it, the, the harder it gets to do. I think Henry's comment about Boulder is a really easy example, and Boulder will get gets bigger every day, right? So, <laughs> everywhere along this line is right in the path of growth. That's that's why we felt the need for it as a as a as a city, uh, as a metro area. Right. And Chris, I think you you hit the nail on the head. That, that that's exactly the case. And if you look at uh, the increase in costs from um, 2001, when we first started talking with the BNSF to today, it, it has increased. Uh, our parking rights have also increased. Uh, PTC along the corridor, which was not a requirement originally, uh, ha has changed things. Uh, technologies, what kind of technology we're gonna run on the corridors. Uh, all that has added to the overall cost. Now, the question uh, that nobody's asked, but I'm gonna throw it, throw it a number, not a number, but a scheduling out there. Uh, BNSF can double track anytime they want. They own the corridor. Uh, the question is, can they stay within the, uh, the property they own? There are some areas that they need to, to bulb out, but their operations has not gotten to a point that they need it to double track this part of their network. So they have double and triple track from Chicago to California 
down through Texas, New Mexico, Arizona, and to California. Uh, they've got areas uh, going north that they've double tracked. Uh, this is a low priority for them, for their freight, for the need for double tracking. Uh, so we probably won't see that anytime soon unless somebody comes up with the funding. Uh, the ability for them to build and do it themselves is a whole lot greater than us getting in there and doing it. Uh, our challenges is the, uh, the controlling factor is the technology, the equipment, and uh, the maintenance facility to run on their system. Uh, so I just want to throw that out there that uh, once we get a go-ahead, we still have to um, take care of the technology, the equipment, buy the, tech, the equipment, and then a maintenance facility. I don't think it's going to be a controlling factor on the BNSF to build. Uh, and the only reason that they haven't done it yet is they've got other priorities across their system today. Do you have any feel for how long it would take them to double track? A couple of years, they could do it. Uh, now, if they're doing it with our funding, then we need to make sure that the environmental is taken care of. So the environmental, the clearance and the permitting, uh, the agreements among the communities, uh, if they were doing it for themselves and uh, not for us a couple years, uh, they'd have to do some basic uh, environmental clearance them for themselves, but uh, they're not locked into the uh, widening the crossings, the quiet zones, station locations, uh, all that adds extra time and dollars to the project. All right, I appreciate that. And it's nice having somebody that comes from that background to be able to speak to some of these issues. Um, I uh, have used up all my time for my presentation, but I really felt what we were talking about here is really critical to, uh, to RTD and, and to the accountability committee as well. So, so I appreciate everyone's time and I'm not gonna run over take a, a, a lot more of it. I will try to put myself at the front of the agenda next time. Let, let me just throw one thing out. If anybody on this group wants more detail and you've got questions after the fact, uh, feel free to reach out to me. Uh, I'm gonna volunteer Bill too. I mean, between the two of us, we should be able to answer most of the questions. Good. And uh, we're more than willing to come back you know, or one-on-one, -on -one. just let us know. Good. I, I suspect you'll hear from me, but that's good. You, you really have helped a lot. And Bill, we appreciate both of your contributions here. And uh, with that, unless I have, does anybody have any final comments, Ron? Yeah, Rod. Sorry, um, I know we're I know we're about at time. Um, since since we ran long today, I would my request of the subcommittee. In the interest, I would remind you all that we have two subcommittees left um, in, one, in both in May to try to wrap up your work so you can formulate some recommendations to make to the full committee for their consideration. So um, I would respectfully request if you could take a look at the, the last memo in the packet today and be prepared for the next meeting to bring back specific thoughts, suggestions, changes to the very draft um, uh, recommendation framework there that was included in that memo. Um, uh, otherwise, y'all are going to run out of time, and I don't want that to happen um, to you. Um, and with that, I can, uh, I'll be done. Great. Ron, these are the ones on Northwest Rail? Or yes, you... Okay. That's correct. Uh, yeah. And certainly on the dashboard, too. Um, dashboard but I think Rebecca was going to kind of take a cut at that as well. Right. I ask everybody to do some homework. We really are going to have to get through these last ones soon. So, what will what what will be our task then, right? Are we going to receive something, Ron, or, or just make sure I? It's uh, Chris. It's in it's in the packet that was sent out oh, today. today. Okay, right. yeah, I didn't get to look at it. Okay, great. Sorry, my fault. Awesome. All right, thank you for the the packet. Appreciate your, your time. Hi. Thanks, Henry and Bill. Hereby adjourn.